Good afternoon and thanks everyone for joining us today for our first BMA event of the year. Um, appreciate everyone taking the time and I am zooming into you via my iPhone because of some technical issues. So um, I apologize, I don't have my BMA backdrop to um, show where I'm calling from. Um, I'm just really excited to be able to be with all of you this afternoon and our panelists who will be introducing shortly, as well as our um, valued um, consultant, Matt Kazin with Avalier Health, who is um, responsible for us being able to make today possible um, to be able to go through the findings um, of the report that we're gonna speak to. Um, and what we wanna do is um, be able to, I'm just gonna tee up some highlights of the findings, um, but then have Matt really um, go through it, answer questions, and then wanna turn and have a discussion um, with our panel. For those of you who may be joining um, this um, webinar and haven't joined before, um, or familiar with um, Better Medicare Alliance. We are a not-for-profit alliance um, whose mission is to strengthen and protect Medicare Advantage. And we do that working closely with our 190 allies and nearly 900,000 um, senior um, grassroots who are nationwide um, who are committed to that same mission. And we do advocacy work here at BMA, and also we focus a lot on commissioning research like the study that we're gonna to speak to today. And we're so excited that we're able to release this report earlier this week. And it's a perfect example of the kind of work that we do both in sharing findings, research, issue briefs with policymakers, with the administration, Capitol Hill, and then also bringing diverse voices together from our ally community um, to talk about um, how um, these issues impact the MA beneficiaries they serve and how we can have discussions around the disparate interests within the MA community. Um, I just wanted to highlight the panelists that we're gonna have joining us shortly um, after, before I tee off a few highlights of the study. Uh, we have Dr. Mark Fendrick, um, professor and director at the University of Michigan, the Center for Value-Based Insurance Design. And we also have Jordan Samaggio, the Director of Development um, for the Las Vegas YMCA. And I'm sorry, we don't have um, Dr. Ben Kortznitzer joining us. Um, and it's Kortznitzer, excuse me. He is the Chief Medical and Quality Officer with Agilon Health, one of our allies. Um, ben um, is ill and um, just came um, down with the illness in the last 24 hours. So we wanna make sure he's healthy so we can continue to turn to him um, to be um, an active um, participant in our advocacy work. I did wanna share, um, if some of you are wondering how we're kicking the year off with this report, what led us to doing this um, study and commissioning the work with Avalier Health. You know, as many of us begin this year, um, we're looking at the number of seniors and people with disabilities who continue to choose MA. And as many of you know, in our MA community, enrollment in Medicare Advantage is expected to reach nearly half of all Medicare beneficiaries. And so we just found it really important to assess the clinical impact and the effectiveness of the MA model for diseases like disability, like diabetes, excuse me, and as well as to understand the differences in how seniors are benefiting from um, the services and the program of Medicare Advantage compared to fee for service. And Matt will go through some of those um, differences um, when he speaks. And again, what we solely were focusing on were those differences in type two diabetes as it related to detection, treatment, outcomes, and then spending. The study um, looked at beneficiaries across three um, distinctions of the disease phases of diabetes. And that includes prediabetes, incident diabetes, and chronic diabetes. And nearly one third of individuals over 65 and older have type two diabetes. So it was really important to be focusing on this patient um, population. And 
sorry, I'm going to shut off the computer that failed me earlier. It's making some um, unfriendly noises. Apologies for the background. Um, and so we wanted to really understand the magnitude of the diabetes impact on older adults and just how it underscores the importance to better understand how to prevent and treat it. And um, again, the study um, looked at outcomes and it really want, we wanted to zero in on how MA beneficiaries are receiving higher quality care and cost-effective care um, compared to Medicare fee-for-service. And in closing, um, I just, because I don't want to steal the thunder from Matt, although I can't really compete um, with his expertise, but what the sort of one main takeaway that the research is telling us is that MA is already at work engaging the unique needs of these beneficiaries and that earlier detection and greater use of preventive care um, is what's leading to um, fewer hospitalizations and lower total medical costs. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg, who's gonna introduce Matt. And then we're gonna hear from Matt and then we're gonna come back to the panel with Mark and Jordan to ask questions. And obviously we wanna make sure we leave um, time for you all to ask questions. So thank you, Greg. Thanks Mary Beth. And again, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we are very fortunate to again have with us today, Matt Kazin, who's the managing director at Avalier Health. Avalier Health is one of the nation's premier health policy consulting and research firms that provides strategic advice to clients in navigating the ever-changing and complex legislative and regulatory environment. Prior to joining Avalier, Matt served on the Senate Finance Committee under former Senator Max Baucus and current Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden. As the senior health policy advisor in this capacity, Matt was the primary policy advisor on healthcare policy issues, including Medicare Advantage or Part D. Matt was also involved in a number of landmark legislative efforts, including the Affordable Care Act, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Matt holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Denver and a master in public policy from George Washington University in Washington, DC. Matt is gonna provide an overview of the key findings of the report that we're focused on today, and then we will move to our panel. With that, I'm happy to turn over to our colleague, Matt Kazan. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Mary Beth for that fantastic introduction. And thank you all for uh, attending the webinar today. Um, here at Avalier, we're very excited to uh, release uh, this study and talk about the results. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, uh, of course, there are a number of people that worked on this study. I want to give them a quick shout out before we uh, dive into the details. Tom Cordfield, Emily Gillen, Brooke Gatachow, um, and a whole host of uh, Avalier experts who uh, worked on this study um, that we are thrilled to talk about today. Um, as Mary Beth talked about, the, the primary kind of research question on uh, for this study was how do um, varying types of uh, patients with diabetes, um, are there differences between their experience with the healthcare system and outcomes uh, between Medicare Advantage enrollees and those who are in uh, fee-for-service? So if we advance uh, uh, one more slide, we can dive in. But Obviously, context matters, and there's a number of reasons why these are important questions to think about. Obviously, as Mary Beth talked about, um, MA growth in the Medicare program um, is high, and we are uh, coming to a point in which more beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage than fee-for-service. Similarly, the prevalence of diabetes is in, in the Medicare population is high, which is, uh, I assume, not a shock to anyone uh, on the line today. Um, and that academic research suggests that um, manage certain types of management of diabetes patients benefits those patients. So all three of these kind of uh, kind of background information kind of come together and I think illustrate really nicely why it is important to ask, are there differences between how patients with diabetes uh, fare 
when they're in Medicare Advantage versus fee for service. So again, that's the critical kind of research question that we uh, we dove into on this particular study. So if we advance one more slide, we do find that there, in many instances, are differences. Um, uh, and major differences in some cases uh, between diabetes patients in Medicare Advantage versus fee for service. We looked at kind of three cohorts of uh, patients: patients with pre-diabetes, patients who had just received a diagnosis for diabetes. We'll refer to them as incident uh, patients or uh, incident diabetes, and then those with chronic diabetes, those who have had type two diabetes for at least one year. So we looked at those three uh, cohorts separately um, because they they demand different um, management and different services. So we thought it was important to break those out. Uh, I'll dive into a bunch of different findings. Uh, on this slide, we put uh, some of the key findings here. Uh, patients with prediabetes, for example, were diagnosed quicker uh, if they were in Medicare Advantage than uh, if they were in fee-for-service. Those incident diabetes patients, those patients who had just received a uh, diagnosis, were more likely to receive a diabetes-related medication or a medication for a related condition if they were in Medicare Advantage rather than uh, fee-for-service. Those chronic diabetes patients, um, uh, we saw similar rates of uh, primary care physician office visits between MA and fee-for-service. Not a big difference there, but we did see MA patients receiving more diabetes-related physician services than those patients who were in uh, fee-for-service. Um, we looked at uh, a variety of kind of outcome measures, which are certainly uh, important. Uh, patients, for instance, with pre-diabetes, uh, we saw fewer emergency department visits and hospital admissions if those patients were in Medicare Advantage versus fee-for-service. And we also saw that total medical spending was lower for patients with diabetes in the Medicare Advantage program uh, rather than fee-for-service. We also looked at subpopulations and found major differences among duly eligible patients, those who are uh, enrolled in both Medicare and Medicaid that have diabetes. Uh, for instance, we saw those duals who are in the Medicare Advantage program um, saw more primary care physician, uh, more primary care uh, office visits, and also uh, received more uh, diabetes-related medications than their uh, colleagues over on the fee-for-service side. So again, here's some of the key findings. Uh, the full report has a huge number of uh, outcome measures. And actually, if we go to the next slide, um, one more, um, we can. you'll see the kind of categories of measures that we looked at. Before I dive in on some of those um, um, outcomes, I do want to talk a little bit about the methodology of the study, because I do think the team did a, a fantastic job putting together uh, this study, and I think it holds up very well. Um, so essentially what we did was take uh, claims data from both fee-for-service and the Medicare Advantage uh, program. And, and Avalier has access to 100% of the fee-for-service claims data and has access to a, a, a very robust amount of Medicare Advantage claims data. And actually for this particular study, uh, our claims data on the Medicare Advantage side represented about half of total enrollment in the program. So a huge robust data set that we were able to pull from uh, for this particular study, which is so important when you think about uh, studies like these. We then, uh, the goal was then to try to compare similar patients uh, with the key difference being, are they in Medicare Advantage or fee-for-service? And so uh, through some uh, 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 sophisticated matching process where we take beneficiaries um, and match them based on a whole host of demographics, age, race, gender, dual status, a bunch of different characteristics, which are listed in the appendix of this presentation, as well as the report, to try to find very similar people. And, and, and with the only major difference being, uh, are they enrolled in Medicare Advantage or are they enrolled in fee-for-service? And that's how we're able to uh, kind of compare the experience over time. It was a multi-year uh, study in terms of looking at those claims uh, data. Uh, compare the experience of these patients uh, and how they differ, whether or not they were in Medicare Advantage or fee-for-service. As I mentioned, we looked at a, a whole bunch of uh, outcome measures, looking at uh, disease uh, detection and severity, uh, medications and testing, uh, 
groups like primary care uh, and diabetes related services, uh, acute care, as I mentioned, uh, ED visits, hospital admissions, uh, et cetera. And then as well as um, spending, both in terms of overall and diabetes uh, related spending. So if we advance one more slide, as I mentioned, and this provides a little bit more detail, we wanted to look at important cohorts and, and, and different kind of subsets of diabetes patients. Um, and we wanted to look at those patients over a different period of time, depending on their unique circumstances. So first we looked at a, a pre-diabetes cohorts, the, uh, those patients who are at risk of being diagnosed with uh, type two diabetes. And we wanted to understand how effective MA plans are compared to fee-for-service in terms of detecting or avoiding a progression towards uh, type 2 diabetes. Then we looked at the second cohort, which were uh, which are named kind of incident diabetes cohort, or those patients who had just received an initial diagnosis for type 2, type, type 2 diabetes. They had not had that diagnosis in the previous uh, 12 months. And we looked at those folks over the course of a 36-month period, and we wanted to know how effective our fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage in managing diabetes after that uh, diabetes diagnosis. And then finally, we looked at a kind of cohort of chronic uh, diabetes patients, those who have had type 2 diabetes for at least one year. And we looked at that over a, a, a longer period of time, and we wanted to know, again, how these patients were being managed uh, for complications and other comorbidities in both MA and fee-for-service. So you'll see on subsequent slides and you'll see in the report us uh, referring to those various cohorts. Now you have a, a little bit of understanding of, of the differences there and, and why uh, the study wanted to take a look at these three groups uh, separately. So let's dive in uh, on the results, uh, which I think are uh, very interesting. So if we advance one more slide, um, looking at uh, patients with prediabetes, one of the major findings that we found was that patients who were in MA um, were diagnosed with diabetes um, sooner than those uh, with uh, fee-for-service. And the kind of complication of um, once they were uh, diagnosed was lower in Medicare Advantage than it was for fee-for-service. So other related conditions that go along with uh, uh, diabetes, less prominent upon diagnosis, uh, meaning uh, there is a potential that Medicare Advantage uh, plans are kind of catching this disease uh, and diagnosing this disease sooner than if the same person were in the fee-for-service program. We advance one more slide. Um, I mentioned this a little bit, and this provides a little bit more detail, um, but Medicare Advantage patients um, who had just received a diagnosis uh, for diabetes um, were more likely and more often filled prescriptions for diabetes medications. We know how important um, uh, prescriptions are for this particular patient population. Um, and we found that Medicare Advantage plans uh, were, uh, were filling these uh, prescriptions at a higher rate than similar patients in the fee-for-service program. We advance one more slide. Um, in terms of interaction with the healthcare system and in particular uh, physician visits, as I mentioned, we did see relatively similar utilization of primary care services among uh, patients with diabetes. Uh, this is the chronically uh, 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 chronic diabetes patients, uh, similar primary care office visits, but you can see um, a higher rate of visits that are related to diabetes uh, in patients with uh, patients enrolled in the Medicare Advantage program rather than uh, in fee-for-service. Next slide, please. Um, across all of our cohorts, we saw that Medicare Advantage patients with diabetes had fewer emergency department visits than those similar patients in fee-for-service. And as you can tell from this slide, in, in, in some cases, substantial fewer uh, ED visits uh, in the Medicare Advantage program versus fee-for-service. Um, pretty interesting numbers uh, on this particular slide here. Uh, next slide, please. Another, uh, another interesting statistic and, and, and finding that we found was around total medical spending. Obviously, um, policymakers, stakeholders, very focused on bending the cost curve, thinking about the cost of care for chronically ill beneficiaries. We found uh, that in all phases, and you can see uh, the difference is, is pretty pronounced in incident and chronic 
that total um, spending um, for uh, diabetes patients was lower uh, for patients who are enrolled in Medicare Advantage than, they, than spending was for those similar patients in fee-for-service over a 12-month uh, period. Next slide, please. Um, you can read more about this in the report. We do a lot of uh, findings and outcomes based on subpopulations, dually eligible beneficiaries. Obviously, folks understand um, the, a, a particularly vulnerable population, a population that we see a, a, a lot of spending and, and potentially poor outcomes. So we, we thought it was important to take a look at that uh, subpopulation as part of the study. And we found that dual eligible patients who had uh, with diabetes who were enrolled in MA did see more primary care uh, uh, utilization than uh, those same kind of similar dual diabetes patients in fee-for-service. So while we didn't see that big difference um, across the board, across all patients uh, between MA and fee-for-service, we did see that MA is, uh, has higher rates of primary care office visits for those dually eligible patients. Uh, and we did uh, see that across all uh, cohorts. So again, we wanted to pull out just a couple of the findings. The full report is kind of chalked through, chalked filled with um, a bunch of interesting uh, findings. Um, but you know, important key takeaways, you know, in summary, is that uh, type two. Our findings show that uh, diabetes is uh, is often diagnosed and treated earlier um, uh, for patients that are enrolled in the Medicare Advantage program rather than fee for service. Um, we saw uh, instances of higher preventive care for patients with diabetes who are enrolled in Medicare Advantage, things like testing, prescription drugs, um, and importantly, saw uh, lower use of acute care services, hospital use, emergency department use for those patients that were in Medicare Advantage um, rather than fee-for-service. And that in turn uh, uh, turned to lower overall uh, medical spending. Uh, for patients who were enrolled in Medicare Advantage uh, than fee-for-service. Um, some differences uh, between uh, the cohorts, as, uh, as we mentioned, uh, and so the, the full report breaks down the findings um, by uh, cohorts for uh, many of these uh, key outcomes. So those are interesting if folks want to uh, dig in on those. Um, but given where, we, where I started my remarks in terms of the the size of the Medicare Advantage program, the, the high prevalence of diabetes in this particular um, uh, program overall, I think these, these findings are important uh, to think about maybe the, uh, the future trajectory of service use for patients with diabetes, medical spending for patients with diabetes, and just the overall uh, health of the, of, the, of the program. So with that, uh, I encourage folks to uh, um, read the report um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that audience folks have after I turn it back over to uh, Greg uh, to kick off the, uh, the panel discussion. Thank you, Matt. Uh, really appreciate that presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Beth to uh, kick off the panel discussion. Great. Thanks, Greg. And thanks very much, Matt and the Avalier Health team. Again, um, we really appreciate the work that you did here. Um, what I want to do is um, with Mark and Jordan is um, ask um, each of them questions and then I have questions collectively for them. And then we want to open it up to questions that you all may have for Mark Jordan and also Matt going back to his um, presentation. Um, so Mark, I thought I would kick it off with you um, and um, I'll turn to Jordan and then I have um, some questions for the um, both of you, but really want to also have that be a discussion. So um, this is really just to kick it off. But, you know, Mark, we know the important um, that's laid on access to prescription medicines and that that is um, where some seniors see a value of MA and why um, they choose MA, um, especially when it's managing chronic conditions like diabetes. And according to the research that Matt just um, laid out, MA beneficiaries with diabetes have higher prescription fills than some similar patients enrolled in fee-for-service. And just curious your perspective and insight on what lessons can be learned from 
um, experiences in MA where um, the program's ensuring that patients are receiving and filling their prescriptions for these medicines. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, Mary Beth. Thank you and Greg for having me. Uh, I've been a ally of the Better Medicare Alliance since its inception. And it's uh, really fascinating. I want to thank Matt and the Avalier folks for some really interesting contributions to the literature. So you know I often uh, start most comments with Americans don't care about health care costs. They care about what it costs them. And one of the reasons why I've been so supportive of Medicare Advantage is uh, while there are much more sophisticated issues around total cost of care, the evidence quite, is quite clear in diabetes and elsewhere that MA beneficiaries pay less out of pocket uh, than their similarly matched individuals in, in traditional Medicare. When it comes to diabetes mellitus, and particularly type 2, and, and Jordan can speak to the preventive aspect of this, but as a primary care provider, in addition to a researcher in this space, this is a very prevalent but also complicated disease. And while we're only talking about medications, which are lower out-of-pocket costs be, bene be beneficial, it's really understanding uh, importance of the continuity and the coordination that would come in Medicare Advantage compared to a, a, a patient who is seeing disparate and unrelated uh, clinicians across the diabetes mellitus spectrum. It's not just blood sugar. We worry about blood pressure. We have annual eye exams. We very carefully take care of our patients' feet. We deal with nutritionists and social workers and mental health providers. And one of the reasons why I see one of the most prominent findings for me is lower emergency visits and likely lower <laughs> hospital rates is not just that people are seeing primary care providers. That number was not surprisingly similar, but the required coordination and the teamwork that often comes with enrollment in MA plan, is, in my opinion, is likely to have led to those better outcomes. And uh, as someone who's focused very much, as you know, Mary Beth, on, on enhancing equity, I particularly worried about underserved populations who don't have the access and often affordability to medications first and foremost, but also these other services that a diabetic patient may require, such as lancets and syringes and other types of glucose monitors uh, is, of course, does not surprise me that the combination of the coordination and continuity coupled with the supplemental benefits that may come in an MA plan, such as nutrition and transportation, and of course, the <laughs> famous silver sneakers programs, uh, which I'm sure uh, fitness is something Jordan will speak about, particularly in the preventive realm, is why I really do believe uh, that these advantages that Matt presented were actually real. Thank you, Mark. Um, and when I turn to Jordan, I want him to have an opportunity to you know, respond to um, some of the comments that you made, especially as it relates to um, some of those um, supplemental benefits that um, seniors receive um, from being um, in the communities with the YMCAs. Um, you know, you can't have a discussion with you, Mark, without turning to value-based care. <laughs> um, so in the context of the important efforts where we are trying to move more towards value-based care, what do you see as strategies that policymakers could consider to improve, you know, access to clinically appropriate treatments, including prescription medicines, you know, for patients who are managing chronic um, conditions, including diabetes. So uh, thanks for asking. And, and, and Matt's probably smiling in the fact that I'm not beating on his door in his old role on Capitol Hill, trying to make these points more clearly and thrilled <laughs> to see several members on the webinar who might be able to make this happen. So what, you know, in a very concise way, I think the best way to move this forward in terms of management of people with diabetes, let alone only chronic conditions, is one, coordination of care. Uh, second is coverage for those evidence-based services. And lastly, alignment, which uh, in value-based care, which is particularly around payment reform, it also is important regarding benefit design. So if you're going to encourage and measure clinicians like myself to get uh, diabetic patients to go to the eye doctor every year, uh, it should be easy, not hard, for the patient to afford going to the eye doctor every year. And, and one of the things that's most exciting about the CMMI Medicare Advantage value-based insurance design model test, it not only takes uh, what Medicare Advantage plans are doing for diabetic patients across the country, but even going further and allowing for the first time uh, MA plans to reduce cost sharing, 
for specific medications for specific clinicians and you know, specific populations for the first time. So previously, if you lowered a cost share, for instance, Mary Beth, for an eye exam, you had to lower it for everyone. To lower cost sharing for a statin or a blood pressure medicine that diabetic individuals take, as well as non-diabetic individuals take, before the MAV demo, it was impossible to be this tailored. So I view MA plans to be a little bit more precise than a a patient who sees multiple clinicians in a, in a, in a traditional fee-for-service sense in some settings, and the Medicare Advantage value-based insurance design demonstration, particularly when it be aligned with alternative payment models that get away from volume-based fee-for-service to value-based services, I think that would be an important step forward that many people, including BMA and other constituencies, have been making to policymakers for quite some time. We've had some successes, clearly, uh, we this is my first event since the insulin copay cap was put in mm -hmm. place five dollars a month. We have Part D vaccines, which are very important uh, for Medicare beneficiaries, whether it be fee for service or MA, uh, no out of pocket costs. So uh, you know, slow and steady steps, but we still have a long way to go. And and we really appreciate your advocacy for patients to make sure they get the care they need in a place they could actually visit at a price they can afford. Well, thank you, Mark, and um, appreciate you, you know, recognizing the steps that have been taken to include, you know, insulin and then also some of the oral anti-diabetes medications and um, hear you on the slow and steady, um, but glad that we, you know, have these um, policies getting in place to at least start that path. Um, so want to shift a bit from the value-based conversation to um, more evidence-based um, preventive care with Jordan. You know, as we heard from Matt, one of the key findings of the report is that MA beneficiaries are more likely to receive evidence-based preventive care services um, than those enrolled in fee-for-service. And so Jordan, I was looking to see if you could share your insights um, about your partnerships and work in the Las Vegas community as it related to MA plans and you know, also just with those collaborations, if you can share some specific strategies um, that you see working. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mary Beth, for, for the question and, and for welcoming the YMCA uh, in, this, in this dialogue. I think it's important to recognize that uh, whether you're from an, a low income household on Medicaid or you're a senior on Medicare, uh, you need access to holistic environments that systematically improve health out outcomes. And with healthy living as one of the YMCA's three pillars, we, we are uniquely positioned to address uh, items like social determinants of health. So items like food and childcare and social isolation, <laughs> research-driven preventative health programs like exercise classes and nutrition programs and wellness workshops. And as Mark alluded to um, before, evidence-based chronic disease management programs, such as those for individuals that are diagnosed with diabetes or cancer or arthritis, just to name a few. Payers across the nation already recognize this tremendous value that the Y brings in the healthcare outcomes uh, conversation. And thanks to Medicare Advantage, many are already partnering with Ys to fund this work in several states, including Nevada. Uh, take the WISE diabetes prevention and, and management work as, as just one example. The Medicare Advantage payer and, and YMCA collective impact trifecta here um, has resulted in 94% of participants reducing their portion size, 83% reporting improvement in self-esteem, 88% increasing their physical activity, 91% reported improved uh, overall health, and a cost savings of $2,650 per individual in uh, medications and, and ER visits. So as an as a organization, as a charitable organization that's been around for 178 years, the Y is really ingrained within the communities that we serve. And that allows us to best serve particularly vulnerable and underserved populations like those that Mark was, was mentioning uh, just earlier. Uh, think of minority groups here uh, who are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with type two diabetes. Also within this, this space of, of um, serving those that need us most, uh, seniors are our fastest growing membership demographic. And, and that's in part thanks to the many privately managed care plans through Medicare Advantage that YMCA 
uh, that add YMCA membership as a value added benefit. And, and here it's of critical importance because we know that one in three people within this particular demographic have type two diabetes. So in these, in these ways and in, in so many more, the why as a charity and as a community-based organization is rising to the challenge of ensuring equitable and holistic access to meaningful programs that are proven to improve health outcomes and lower those health costs. Thank you, Jordan. And, you know, just as you talk about, um, you know, equity and the holistic aspect, you know, YMCA's leadership is so present in communities and regardless of um, someone's, you know, background, they rely on the multitude of services that you provide. Um, but obviously a lot of it is the focus that you give on prevention. And so I just wanted to dive a bit into what policymakers can, you know, learn from the lessons that um, you've um, been able to both um, be challenged by, but identify solutions in the community is when we look at the elements of a successful diabetes prevention program, what will you see as you know, challenges or opportunities that can be applied to the Medicare population? Because we always wanna be seen as, um, you know, as much as we see MA grow growing, there's um, the large number of seniors who are in um, Medicare. And as we partner with the administration, you know, what are we able to learn from our work um, that we're able to share um, with um, policymakers? I think it's a great follow up, Mary Beth. Um, you know, the whys, um, the why the wise approach to this this topic is is quite comprehensive and and intentional and um, the the result of that has been quite successful and it's why millions turn to the YMCA as a preventative health uh, organization um, and why we work tirelessly to ensure that everyone has access like you were talking about and, and Mark was was mentioning as well um, regardless of their their age their income their background. So the intervention framework here exists and it continues to be built upon and strengthened. Uh, and the in-need populations for these various um, health interventions and preventative health programs, they're ever present and, and, and they're in need of these programs and they are ready to jump in. Where organizations like the Y struggle is oftentimes navigating complex administrative requirements. And, and sometimes the funding is unsustainable when um, mismatched with those those complex administrative burdens. A good example here is our evidence-based diabetes prevention program. Uh, YMCs across the nation um, have this program and our association here uh, in Nevada uh, had it for, for many years, but the heavy weight of administrative requirements increases the cost of facilitating this program beyond what payers are able to reimburse. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this program is proven to render significant benefits to participants and payers alike, um, but the administrative burdens coupled with mismatch funding is forcing Y associations like my own to have to suspend this program and pivot to others. Uh, the impact impact on payers and the society at large is going to be detrimental if organizations like the Y can't sustain these critical care programs, which is why I can't stress enough the crucial importance of a robust Medicare Advantage system coupled with meaningful partnerships between payers and community-based organizations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So bit of a Yes, Mark, I was going to ask if you had anything to comment on. I, you know, first of all, uh, where has Jordan been all my life? So it's so fabulous <laughs> to me. So uh, while I, I talk about the diabetic eye exam as a lack of alignment between benefit design not being generous and payment being high, uh, the diabetes prevention program that Jordan mentions that I ha had argued for many, many years to guarantee coverage uh, does not guarantee delivery. And it's it's one of the great examples where actually coverage is not the barrier, but payment rates are the barrier or other administrative burdens. So when I look, Mary Beth, uh, as a clinician and a population health researcher about type 2 diabetes, you think about it through a, a much higher elevation lens than someone who's working on the ground like Jordan. So first, of course, we want to prevent this condition. Uh, some of it is medical, but of course, uh, your many of your plans, Mary Beth, are going beyond the medical world and thinking seriously about non-medical socioeconomic determinants, like, again, nutrition support, 
as well as transportation and other types of needs. Even some plans are getting now into the role of, of better housing uh, and, and reducing uh, food deserts that might allow the prevention to move forward. To follow up on your question to Jordan is you know, a great debate on Capitol Hill, as Matt and Greg know, but also now a national discussion as of 60 minutes of last Sunday is will Medicare determine obesity and unhealthy weight as a chronic medical condition and actually start providing coverage uh, mm -hmm. for very exciting, although some yet to be unproven interventions that may significantly impact unhealthy weight, which has direct ramifications on the prevention of type 2 diabetes. But there's also issues, of course, about uh, exciting information about some organizations that actually reverse type 2 diabetes. But what I focus on primarily in my practice, where Matt showed uh, is quite successful with MA, is uh, keeping people stable with the condition who have it for a long period of time, preventing complications, of course, and uh, what Medicare feels very, very strongly about when you think about the long-term and dangerous sequelae of type 2 diabetes, which are primarily heart disease, uh, stroke, and end-stage renal disease. This is what um, are the significant health and economic consequences of this condition, which evidence quite shows well that if you follow the quality-based metrics for the management of this condition, they could be decreased a significant amount. And reiterate, as I always do, and Jordan helped me with this, is that given the, the current administration's focus on reducing disparities in healthcare mm -hmm. equity, the time is now to think about reaching out further to those underserved populations for services that either they are, do not have coverage for, which is usually not a problem in MA, but if, even if they do have coverage for to help them get access for some of the reasons that Jordan mentioned and others that uh, we'll talk about perhaps later. Jordan, did you want to say anything there um, on follow-up or I can um, jump to a question for the both of you? Uh, no, I think Mark uh, summarized that that quite effectively as, as as he always does. I think really it comes down to the the concept of accessibility being multidimensional. It's both the the concept of affordability, but also accessibility in the realm of of comprehensive or or holistic environments. So uh, that's really where Medicare Advantage thrives, especially in the diabetes uh, prevention and management realm. Thank you, Jordan. Well, I'm going to try to squeeze in at least one question for the both of you. I know um, I don't want to stand in the way of our um, audience and also um, to bring Matt in here as well. But, you know, we here at BMA, when we're hearing from um, the both of you of the successes of MA and caring for these vulnerable populations, we always want to you know, dive in on you know, public policy implications of any of the research that we do. And so when you look at where, um, you know, MA has been a success, um, you know, and we want to try to see how we can apply these care models more broadly across the healthcare system, you know, what would you see could be applicable when we're looking at the public and private insurance programs and what could be applied? Jordan, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, YMCAs are actually um, in an innovative space here where we're starting to work um, with payers on value added benefits. And a good example here is uh, our own association working with uh, Centene and, and Silver Summit Health Plan to really identify what, uh, what do we mean when we say comprehensive or holistic environments? What specific programs can we connect back to the prevention and management of chronic diseases like, like diabetes? Uh, and then how do we measure that to ensure our success in what we're trying to do? And then how do we adapt when we're finding areas where the, the connection um, is, is not as strong as, as we'd like it? So um, I think that um, our, our, our healthcare community and community-based organizations are starting to find innovative um, solutions to this topic already. Um, happy to add on to that. Curious what, what Mark's experience is with this. Well, uh, Jordan, thanks. If I were fee for service, I'd take the rest of the time, but I'll, I'll act like a good capitated doc, Mary Beth, and, and kind of summarize some of these things quickly. So in thinking about what's going on uh, currently in discussion, one of the great silver linings of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is the attention we were in current payment of virtual health and telemedicine. And as you know, Mary Beth, quite well, uh, BMA and the Medicare Advantage Vita demo we're one of the few organizations talking about the potential benefits of healthcare at home, 
or virtual care long before this terrible pandemic hit us. So when you think about the management of, a, of, of either a pre-diabetic that Jordan is trying to prevent from becoming a diabetic or the diabetics that I see quite commonly in my office, when you think about some of the parameters that we need to follow closely, and my partners, such as uh, pharmacists, social workers, uh, nutritionists, that many of the patients who we deal with can be uh, interacted with at a very high level of satisfaction at their home. So if you think about some of the things that we tend to follow on a regular basis, uh, weight, which can be now transmitted electronically, uh, blood pressure, which is easily taken and transmitted electronically or verbally or, or, or written through a chart, as well as blood sugars, which are really some of the key things that we follow in the management of type 2 diabetic. And, and I do believe, particularly as, again, we emphasize uh, individuals are not able to take more time off of work or in people in rural areas who have to drive a very long way. Uh, to see their clinician. I think that um, it's continually debated the extension of the telehealth payments uh, in, in Medicare. And I know we're always nervous about the extensions of the public health emergency from one step to the next. But I think that this administration putting real money into broadband infrastructure, as well as preserving uh, telemedicine payments, is something that we need to uh, continue to leverage moving forward. And while I, I think Jordan would agree, I'd love everyone to be able to walk into that beautiful YMCA in, in uh, Las Vegas uh, for the patients who live in the corners of, of the great state of Nevada or in the state of Michigan, it's very far away from our wise that to have an option uh, that's mm -hmm. evidence-based, that's not a required in-person visit is certainly a reasonable alternative. Well, Mark and Jordan, thank you. I wanna bring Matt in um, to be part of this discussion. And as we open it up to questions, I'm gonna to turn to Greg to tee those up. Yes, we have a number of uh, questions coming into uh, the chat function here. Um, so I'm gonna tee up a few of these, uh, just uh, a reminder for the audience, just type those into the Q&A and we will try to get to as many of these um, as possible. I think we'll start with a question here um, to really uh, Avalier, but to the whole panel, um, you know, as far as the findings here, what do you think is the most compelling finding here for policymakers um, as far as demonstrating the strength of Medicare Advantage in treating and slowing the progression of diabetes? I'm happy to start. I mean, policymakers, not surprising to anyone, uh, are focused on government spending. And so to the extent that we saw uh, overall medical spending over an, on an annual basis lower for diabetes patients in Medicare Advantage versus fee-for-service, I presumably that would uh, grab the attention of policymakers who are, are, are always focused on spending in Medicare, but also uh, increasingly focused on spending differences between fee for service and Medicare Advantage. Great, I'll thanks, quick, Matt. Quickly chime in because Matt's a scientist; he can't. So, if you asked me, uh, as you did uh, earlier this week, at what is actually driving the, the very exciting from a clinician patient-centered outcome standpoint, uh, the reduction in ER visits and likely reduction in hospitalizations, um, it may in fact be better management uh, because people are filling their prescriptions a little more. A um, little more common. I actually think, uh, as you know, Greg, I, uh, leverage the, the continuity and the coordination of MA compared to traditional fee for service. So if you have a, a high blood pressure or a super high uh, blood sugar event or other type of that, if you had a team of clinicians that you know you could contact to either A, manage it earlier before it became a crisis, or could talk to someone before you ran to the ER because you didn't have somewhere else to go, I personally believe. It's a combination of the better management, but maybe even more so the fact that MA patients tend to have an individual or team of clinicians that they could contact to prevent them to going from the uh, emergency room unnecessarily. Uh, you know, Matt and his claims has no idea to know the severity or the clinical indications of those ER visits, but uh, I, I do think that um, diabetic patients need to go to the emergency room. And my guess is that you'll probably find that those in MA who went to the emergency room are probably more clinically indicated or true emergencies than folks who uh, had to make a decision without someone to advise them uh, whether to either go to urgent care or even better to wait to see your PCP in a day or two because it's not truly an emergency. 
Yeah, and, and Mary Beth, if I can just um, uh, try to put uh, both a couple points from both um, Matt and Mark, um, or what I'll call our, our M and M duo. Um, I, you know, when we're talking about the concept of funding and preventative health, we're we're talking about efficient spending, which means also efficient funding. So uh, what some community-based organizations like The Y are doing is they're in the virtual realm. So we're offering programs within our, our rural communities to make sure that they have equitable access as well to some preventative health services, or we are trying to be efficient in getting outside of Y buildings, understanding transportation is a barrier, and we're hiring healthy heart ambassadors, for example, that are going out in communities and teaching individuals how to take um, their blood pressure and and how to eat well, shop well, cook well, and giving them access to transportation resources if they are in a food desert. So there's really there's really creative, innovative strategies that we can use um, in this preventative health realm with efficient spending. But what we need to ensure is right now this is being covered. But if uh, Medicare Advantage does not continue to be a robust system, then these types of preventative health systems start to fade and they start to diminish because they're no longer sustainable and then the costs will go right back into the healthcare system and right back into um and government burden so you you cut here but you get the expense back in this other realm let's go to another question from the audience here this will be uh for matt kazan and the avalier team did you find significant variability in outcomes depending on which ma program the individual was enrolled in so here matt I know the study looked at uh, the Medicare Advantage population overall, but also a focus on duals. I think that's kind of what the question's getting at, you know, different types of MA plans or programs. And was there any significant findings there as it relates to variability of results? Yeah, it's a good question. We did. We certainly did uh, find differences in uh, the experience of duly eligible patients with diabetes um, that maybe did not uh, show in the kind of broader population. I, I highlighted one about primary care. Uh, we did not examine any differences in patient outcomes amongst individual MA plans. We looked at uh, the MA program as a whole rather than individual parent organizations or individual plans. Great, thanks for that, Matt. Um, let's go to another question here about um, the recently uh, implemented um, cap on insulin that was part of the Inflation Reduction Act goes went to effect January 1st uh, this year, caps copays in Medicare uh, at $35. Do you, what did the panel think about implications there as far as uh, this po policy that's being implemented across Medicare? So let me start, Greg. So thanks for throwing me a bone since you know I, I worked on this policy in three administrations and don't want to forget that it was the previous administration that actually put the senior savings plan model into effect that was so popular that uh, a Democratic president made a Republican president's policy uh, nationwide. So uh, not even Matt, the great researcher he is, could have any idea how well it's working given that it just start, went into effect uh, 11 days ago. But uh, we are seeing uh, social media reports of very happy people particularly during the deductible phase in their health plans at pharmacists uh, around the country moving forward. So I'm gonna tie that point to Mary Beth's question earlier to what policymakers could do. We all know what a struggle it was and that you lived through versions of this to uh, convince the Congress and, and to uh, allow reductions in out-of-pocket costs for a drug that for some individuals, if they don't take it, they will die. Right, And we still have challenges, which is not in the purview of today's discussion about making this real in the commercial sector as well, which there was not enough uh, votes for to make that happen. But specifically to Medicare, uh, we know in the MAV demo that there are MA plans that are reducing co-pays below $35 a month, Greg, not just for insulin, but many, many type 2 diabetics don't need insulin and take, they take oral hypoglycemics that Matt measured. They also take drugs that are high value that don't deal with blood sugar, such as statins for cholesterol, um, a number of medications for blood pressure, and a substantial number of type 2 diabetics also have uh, mental health issues of anxiety, depression. And I'm really happy to report that those MA plans that have lowered cost sharing for those classes of drugs, which you can do in the MAV demo, 
have seen uh, not large enough numbers like Matt had in his report, but anecdotally, you know, remarkable levels of patient satisfaction and at least some preliminary information to say that we're actually going further than what Matt found in broad populations to be able to see what we want to see in terms of patient-centered outcomes and disparity reductions when people truly do have access to those evidence-based and guideline-recommended services. So uh, I know we had success getting insulin covered, Greg, but we have a whole bunch of other services, such as those that were covered in the IRS Rule 2019-45 for high-deductible health plans that would be a welcome, welcome addition uh, to Medicare to keep uh, patients from not being able to afford their medications. Others on the panel want to chime in on this? I was just going to mention that it sounds like Mark is designing the senior savings model 2.0 as we speak. So uh, look towards CMMI on that front. Only for 25 years, Matt, but thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I know we're getting close to time. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Um, I think this will be for our Matt and Avalier team, kind of a methodological question around the report. Uh, so obviously the report compares Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service. When the, when you're comparing the fee-for-service population, is it um, does it include people who have Medicare supplemental coverage or is it just people who are enrolled in Part A and Part B? We did not um, exclude uh, people with Medigap. Our data source doesn't have great individual beneficiary specific info on who has Medigap or not. So given the, the level of Medigap penetration, undoubtedly uh, folks in our sample, uh, some of uh, them will have Medigap and, and some will not, but that is uh, not a, uh, a part of the uh, uh, specific part of the analysis here. Thanks for clarifying that, Matt. Looking at the chat box, I think that kind of wraps up the questions. Um, and I know we're at time. I'm just going to turn it back to Mary Beth for any kind of concluding remarks here. I wanted to thank Matt and the Avalier Health team again for um, this terrific work. And to Mark and Jordan, um, I love your line, Mark, where have you been all my life? So we'll make sure that there is um, a follow-up venue um, where we bring you guys back together. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your insights and perspective. Um, there's no better way to really um, you know, appreciate the um, value of these findings and how we can engage with policymakers than to bring in um, those of you from the academic and research community and our allies to understand it. So thank you again. Thanks to those for joining us this afternoon. And um, the report is on uh, bettermedicarealliance.org. And um, we um, will be seeing you soon. Thank you.